mentoring is very important to you, isn't it? Like you're involved in a number of different organizations, and then of course you're doing it with your own staff. Tell us more about that. If people have an interest, why not help them and mentor them? I had several people that did the same thing for me. So I'm passing that along. During the pandemic, I was approached about a new project called Wine Unify and nonprofit that would help individuals thinking of getting into the wine industry, whether it would be as a sommelier or within distribution, but giving them the tools that they would need, the wine, the glassware, the access to classes, a mentor. And I said, absolutely, sign me up. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 227. Why is Vermentino such a great wine to pair with food and which dishes pair best with it? What are the markers and nuances in wine that are tied to a specific place? And how is the wine industry changing when it comes to diversity and what still needs to be done? You'll hear those tips and stories in part two of my chat with Tonya Pitts, the wine director at One Market Restaurant in San Francisco, whom the Wine Enthusiast magazine recently named Sommelier of the Year. You don't need to have listened to part one from last week first, but I hope you'll go back to it if you missed it after this one. Now a quick update on my upcoming memoir, Wine Witch on Fire, Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Defamation, and Drinking Too Much. I would love to meet you in person. I hope you'll join me for a fabulous book launch and wine tasting on Saturday, May 13th in Niagara. Celebrate spring or Mother's Day in style or treat yourself to a weekend getaway, as we say, sayonara to winter. (laughs) Now, imagine yourself on a beautiful spring day in the middle of wine country at the gorgeous Peller Estates Winery. Bring a friend or come on your own for one of two tastings or a wine pairing lunch or both. Here's what you can expect. You'll savor four outstanding wines as I guide you in a private wine tasting. You'll enjoy my hilarious and heartfelt stories about working in the world of wine. You'll learn about the professional challenges when drinking is your day job. You'll discover how to become a savvier wine buyer with my insider tips And you can ask me anything about wine, writing a book, or rediscovering joy in your personal and professional life. You'll get a personally signed copy of my book with your ticket. I'll put a link in the show notes where you can register, or you can visit nataliemcclain.com forward slash Niagara Launch. We are going to have so much fun together, and I can't wait to meet you. Please come. Also, please let your family and friends know about this event. They're most welcome to join us. So here's a review from Dr. Ken Kardash, an early reader from Montreal. Quote, A fearlessly honest memoir by a professional wine critic who generously shares how she processed personal trauma and grew as a result. After being blighted by divorce, drinking, and dismissal by misogynistic cyberbullies, she emerges as an improved vintage. Many of us can probably relate to the insidious increases in imbibing during the pandemic, but dealing with it as an occupational hazard brings its own insights. Despite the recurrent witch motif, this is not the story of a victimized woman. The witch here is used as a symbol of empowerment. 
and even if it does at times have a sex in the city tone, this story can and should be read by men who will benefit from a woman's perspective on the issues raised. Five stars. Thank you, Ken. And thank you for the comparison to Sex in the City. <laughs> I love that show. All right. In the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 227, I've posted a link to where you can pre-order the book online no matter where you live. This is also where you'll find all of the juicy bonuses you'll get when you pre-order the book. Okay. On with the show. Mentoring is very important to you, isn't it? Like you're involved in a number of different organizations, and then of course you're doing it with your own staff. Tell us more about that. So I've always been very hands-on with teaching, especially I learned a long time ago when you have a staff of people and a team, you can't present something and put something in front of them if they have no idea what it is or they've never experienced it. And so that's one thing I made sure that I gave people kind of a basis. This is what Sancerre tastes like. This is what Bordeaux tastes like if they'd never had it before. And then we can go into, this is what I would like to put on the wine list. This is what I'd like to pour by the glass. Because if people don't have a reference, then I'm the only one that's selling it. That's no fun. So that's how that started. But just with people, as I said, if people have an interest, why not help them and mentor them? Because I had several people that did the same thing for me. And so I'm passing that, definitely, you know, passing that along. During the pandemic, as the pandemic was starting, I was actually approached by Martin Reyes, Master of Wine, about a new project that they had him and Mary Margaret Mechanic and Dylan Proctor, and it was called Wine Unify, and nonprofit that would actually help individuals that were thinking of getting into the wine industry, whether it would be as a sommelier or within distribution, but giving them the tools that they would need, the wine, the glassware, the access to classes, a mentor. And I said, absolutely, sign me up. That's how that started. And then, of course, there was Badinage Forum, a women's organization, which basically focuses on all aspects of wine and having females involved in all of that and kind of as a support system for those of us that were in the industry. And a mentorship program actually has started for Badinage Forum as well. Those are all, there's sales, there's marketing, there's hospitality, there's writing, and they all have mentors within those categories and they have mentees. And so that's another. There's also the United Sommeliers Foundation, which was started during the pandemic by Christy Norman um, and Master Sommelier Chris Blanchard for support for sommeliers during the pandemic and just during crisis. And so that's financial help. So I'm on that board. How do you do all this, by the way? <laughs> oh my goodness. And you've got a full-time job. And <laughs> When you're on a board, it doesn't take all of your time, okay. but it takes, you know, four or five hours a month at oh, the most. Still, that's quite a bit. Yeah. It's important work. Yes, though, it is. You know? Very. I mean, it's very admirable. Yeah. 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 It's all very, very important work. And then also the work that I do with um, the Hugh Society, Tahira Habibi, and the Roots Fund, Carlton McCoy, and Akimi Dubois. They're all things that need to happen. Live Collective as well. You know, if I have time and I can do it, I do it. 
And it's not all of the time. It all kind of comes and goes in cycles. Yes. Yeah. Seasonal. But during the pandemic, there was more time because our lifestyle and how we had done things basically became virtual. Yeah. And things just shifted. Sure. And how does the Hue Society differ from some of the other groups? I'm curious about that one. The Hue Society is made up of black and brown people as well. But what you'll find in the Hue Society, there are people who are just enthusiasts that may want to become involved in wine as well. But definitely it's community oriented and they're in all cities now. They're also abroad now. They also have a chapter in South Africa. Fantastic. And that's a whole nother story. Yeah, I went to South Africa recently during the summer, and that was another eye-opening experience. It's beautiful wine um, region well, there. Taste the yeah. wine. Oh my gosh, Stellenbosch. Stellenbosch. Oh. One of the most beautiful countries and one of the most beautiful wine regions. I've probably the most beautiful wine region I've ever visited. I mean, just so beautiful. They're all farms and breathtaking. Yeah, and the rolling hills and yeah. And so when you started, as you said, there weren't a lot of people of color in the wine industry. So what's happening now? You do so much advocacy. You are a role model. What are the important things that have changed in the wine industry, and what still needs to be done? Well, I think that in light of the pandemic and George Floyd, there was more of a light that was shined on everything. But we were and are a kaleidoscope of people who are all over the world. And it's always been that way. But I think within that community of people that are in wine and in food, we all started to connect more with one another and connecting with someone that lived in Morocco or connecting with someone that lived in Italy or in France or that was working and living in Chicago. We were all trying to connect with one another. And Julia Cooney actually created Black Wine Professionals, which was also basically a network that listed people that were in the industry so that we could all find each other. Mm -hmm. But also if someone wanted to work with any of us, they could find us and have all our information sure. there. That's great. There's also that as well. But, you know, I created Women in Wine while I was working at One Market and it was basically to shine more of a light on women winemakers in the wine industry, which is a very small amount. We're probably at about 12% now that are assistants or winemakers at a winery. And it's growing, but it's something that I wanted to shine a light on because we're just not known. Right. And that was the beginning, beginning of that. And it's just difficult, but it's not just wine. You could go to so many different professions and it's the same. It is. It just so happens that I work in wine. So that's my focus. Absolutely. Bloom where you're planted. I mean, you can make the biggest change from within. That's fantastic. So we need more representation. What are things that we can do, those who are listening, whether they're inside the wine industry or not. They're just wine enthusiasts. What are some things we can do to help advocate for that, help move things ahead? Seek out wines that are produced by women, LBGTQ, and people of color and experience them and support them in their endeavors. Support meaning buy the product, go to their tasting rooms, go to their wine festivals and events, you will be pleasantly surprised. So much wine out there. So many really fantastic, beautiful wines from all over the world, all over the United States. You know, Virginia is also gaining within their community and wine region of growing and producing wine. But, you know, we make wine in 
probably 54 of uh, the states Mm -hmm. in the United States. And they all have communities and they've always made wine. And because it's such a global economy with wine, I think now that people are really taking it much more seriously that live in different states. And if they have a passion and a drive and they can do it, they're doing it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And people learned to order online and they started experimenting with different wines from different regions during the pandemic. I mean, we just, I think consumers became more educated about their choices as well. Most definitely. And yeah. I call it the discovery phase. Okay. And we are still in the discovery phase. I think people are much more open to trying something new and different, whatever it is within beverages. Sure. Even if it's, you know, spirits, beer, Mm -hmm. ciders, all sorts of things. And the explosion that's starting to happen now with non-alcoholic beverages as well is really very interesting. I tasted blind a non-alcoholic rosé a couple of weeks ago, and it was delicious. Wow. It was really, 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 really good. Could you tell and that so, it had no alcohol? Like if you had tasted it and not known, is it apparent that it doesn't have alcohol? No, huh. because it was the flavor profiles that you would expect wow. from a rosé that was produced with Grenache because it's all about the grape. Sure. And do you offer non-alcoholic wines on your list? No. No. Okay. Is that coming maybe? Or would that be something you ever consider in the future? No, probably not. Okay. <laughs> no, probably not. Although, but I'm definitely interested in non-alcoholic options. Sure. Which we do have and we do offer. And I actually want to explore Proxies, which is a new product that's made from wine and made from teas, you can have them on their own, or you can use them as mixers as well to create beverages. And so, oh, wow. so if you have it, people, proxies. Okay, proxies. We'll put yeah. that, a link to mm-hmm. that in the show notes, along with all the organizations yeah. you mentioned earlier. Definitely would love to list those out so people can find those organizations and support them. All this talk about wine is making me thirsty. I don't want to forget to taste (laughs) wine with you, Tonya. So which wines do you have with you there? So two wines. And I love wine. For me, it definitely is a feeling and a moment of what I'm drinking. If people ask me, what do you normally have in a glass? And I say, well, think of it as if you're ending the night or the day with a beer, for me, it would either be sparkling champagne or white wine because I kind of see it as a palate cleanser and kind of as something refreshing. Yes. So I have some white wine this morning. Huh. Breakfast wine. So uh, Chateau du Chamaray, okay, which is a Grand Vin de Bourgogne. From oh, there's the Mercury. Bottle. Yeah, Mercury, and we'll yeah. link to that in the show notes. Yes, so that would be a Chardonnay and, based. Um, it's a Chardonnay based, yeah. and this is really interesting because they're pulling from eight different plots in the vineyard and blending the mm. Chardonnay there. Huh. And oh, oh yeah. when we were talking about you know just sight and soil and. You know, I put my nose in this and the first thing that, you know, I get are these nuances of rock and shale and chalk, but then the fruit comes through and yellow apple, pear, lemon, saline. Mm. Yeah, it's just super, 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 super fresh, bright. Very, very lifted. You're making my mouth water describing it. Yeah. (laughs) Beautiful. I would want something. I would want oysters with this. I would want a seafood pasta, Mm. even truffles. (laughs) 
white truffles. Lovely. I love the way you're nosing it to get the suggestion from the wine itself to tell you what to pair with it. <laughs> the wine is talking to you. <laughs> and that's delicious. Oh, and for the for our first sip of the day, mm-hmm. that's perfect. Yeah. Calibrate your mouth, mm-hmm. your palate. Absolutely. The other, Paggio Altisuro Solo Soul. Toscana. Okay. It's a Vermentino. Oh, how lovely. And it's another young and fresh. What I like about this wine, and it's a screw cap, is that, and I love Vermentino. Mm-hmm. What is it that you love about it? Because it's higher acidity, super, super fresh, bright, lifted. Well, you see, that's a pattern. Sure. But that's what I like mm-hmm. to just kind of wake my palate up. But also, I think it's great for pairing with foods as well, because you could have this with salad, you could have it with pasta, you could have it with poultry, chicken, and you could have it with duck, with quail, vegetables, anything. But this is a little bit weightier in the middle of the palate. Okay. Mm. Hmm. And again, you've got that earth and that rock and that soil. But this is kind of, when I was talking about earth before, when I was talking about wet soil, this is dry and it's kind of powdery. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. When I think of the earth. Mm -hmm. Under the Tuscan sun, no doubt. (laughs) It's nice and dry and powdery. (laughs) And this nose, kumquat, blood orange, some pink grapefruit comes through. And it's the skins and the zest that I'm smelling. Mm. Oh, (laughs) but it's weighty. Right. But it's not so heavy that it will overtake or overpower a meal. Both of these wines would complement a dish, Mm. which is what you want wine to be anyway. Sure. I think wine and food definitely go together. Oh, yeah. You don't always have to have food with wine. No. There are those moments. Pair wine with more wine. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. (laughs) When anybody asks me for my favorite pairing, that's what I tell them. (laughs) But yeah, especially these vibrant whites that get you salivating because as you know, like it's literally the saliva that whets our appetite, but also is going to spread the flavor of both the wine and the food out. It's going to touch and stimulate more taste buds, the more our mouth waters. So, and that's what those zesty whites do with some acidity. Right now, this has higher acid than the uh, Chardonnay. Huh. And I'm completely salivating yes. with this one. Yeah, But that earth that I was talking about, mm-hmm. there's this big stone that's in the middle of my palate huh. that's mixed with all of the fruit that's there. I love that. But I can envision a big stone sinking into wet sand and just kind of falling away. And there are some wines that I will taste, particularly white wines, and that's the vision that comes when I'm tasting those wines. Spoken like a true artist again, the very visual, that layering, the way you experience wine. Wow. So cool. Oh my goodness. I can't believe how quickly this is going. Tonya, I want to ask you a few more questions. Continue to enjoy your wine there, but a few more things because I'm dying to know what you think. Is there anything you believe about wine with which some people might disagree? Some people say that terroir is not true. I mean, there really is a sense of place for everything that's grown. There are markers. There are definitely nuances that are tied to a place anywhere in the world. The other is when people say, I don't know how to taste wine. I can't discern the flavor profiles that are there. I mean, I just, I don't know. The first thing I tell them is pay attention to what you are smelling anywhere. When you go into the market and to produce, start smelling herbs, start smelling Mm. the flowers, because it's basically that Rolodex that we were talking about. Yes. It's all sensory memory. And to have confidence 
Because nine times out of 10, when you put your nose in that glass, the first thing that comes to your mind is the correct thought of what's in that glass. Mm -hmm. Because it's really something personal. True. It's everyone's sensory memory is different and what's stored there is different. Sometimes people will smell or taste something and it takes them to a memory that's connected to whatever scent that they're coming up with that's in that glass. And to always remember that. And sometimes when I say that to people, they're like, what? I'm like, yes. Yeah. Your first thought is your correct thought of what's there. Yes. Trust it. Absolutely. But I'm not a wine expert. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. These are all your sensory memories. Exactly. I remember my first wine class, we were tasting a Riesling and one of the students said, oh, it reminds me of the Dallas airport. And she was getting the petrol off the wine. So, you know, it made sense for her and it was yeah. correct as well. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. What's the sort of weirdest wine and food pairing you've ever tried? Oh, weirdest. Or one that you thought wouldn't work, but it actually did, perhaps. There's an exercise that Chef and I were doing. And I'll call it an exercise because it was a dish and it's still one of my favorite pairings now. And it was roasted, it was sous vide and roasted monkfish sitting on top of a leek potato gratin. And on the bottom of the plate, the sauce was a port red wine sauce, mm. which people were just like, really? Are you sure? <laughs> Fish and red wine, fortified red wine. <laughs> yeah. And it was absolutely stunning. And then we went up the scale of wines to taste to just get it just right. Pinot Noir, no matter where we pulled it from, California, Russian River, even warmer vintages that were just full and rich and riper mm -hmm. didn't work. They kind of fell into the dish. Huh. Cabernet Sauvignon, mountain fruit, it was good but didn't quite knock it out of the park. And then I said, you know what? There are some herb notes and there's that kind of licorice that's coming through from the fennel and that crunch and snap. Hold on. And I ran to the cellar and pulled out Skip Stone's Fault Line, a Cab Franc, coming from Sonoma Mountain. Okay. It was perfect. Oh, wow. It was absolutely perfect. It had enough fruit and enough body, and the fruits were more mulberry, boysenberry, and just fresh blackberry that were kind of unripened fruits, and little slivers of bittersweet chocolate and crema. And it absolutely worked because there was structure and tannin and acidity. And it cut through the richness of the gratin. It cut through the richness of the fish. And it cut through the richness of the sauce. And it was glorious. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. What an it interesting really, pairing. Really was. Yeah. Wow. Very unusual because you would never expect to pair red wine, particularly with monkfish, even though monkfish is meaty, but it's also the poor man's lobster, as we call it, because it's got that sweetness as well, but it was absolutely perfect. Wow. And that's the weird one. That's inspired. <laughs> that's great. Good that you knew like yeah. what to pull. Yeah. Do you have a favorite wine book? I'm sure you've read so many, but does one stand oh, out? Wow. The one that I keep coming back to more and more, and as a reference and from early on, was Karen McNeil's The Wine the Bible. Bible. Classic, yes. And I'm super excited to dive into this new edition because it's expanded and it talks about regions that I'm really excited about. Israel, Greece, all of these regions that 
have come into the fold of being grape growing regions that have been there for millennia, right? Yes. But we don't know a lot about them. Right. And the wines are just spectacular. Yes. I love Israeli wine. Mm. I do. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And wines from Lebanon as well. Yeah. Well, they all tell a story. All wine tells a story, but there are those that are just evocative ancient. Oh. Those are that. That gives me shivers, just the way you describe it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Tonya, this has been amazing. I loved our conversation. Is there anything we didn't touch on that you'd like to mention before we wrap up? We were talking about favorite tools. Oh, yes, please. Okay. Corvin. Corvin, yes. To preserve open wine or to actually extract wine from a corked yeah. bottle. Yeah. So, and it's just pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. That this little gadget holds small canister of argon. And when you put it on top of, which is how I got extracted the wine out this morning to put in my glass, and it's ever so. That's great. A good demo here. And I tell people if you ever want to taste something from your cellar, but you don't want to open the whole bottle, Mm -hmm. this is fantastic. You know, during the pandemic, my mom likes wine, mm-hmm. but she's very particular. Okay. It's my fault early <laughs> on. She loves white burgundy. Mm. And so I tend not to open those all the time and I save them so that we can have them together. Mm-hmm. But if I wanted a little bit, I could use this. Or if I wanted to pull something older out of the cellar and because it was just me, particularly with the reds, she knew she wasn't going to have any. I would use this and I would just taste wine and have a little bit and put it aside for, you know, a couple of months and then come back to it because I was savoring it, yeah. the wine. Lovely. So if you don't want to open a bottle, that is the gadget for you. Well, but you would like to taste the wines. Absolutely. But also, if you want to see how your cellar's doing, right. what you have in your cellar. That's true. That's yeah. also. This maybe a wine is yeah. not ready for drinking and you haven't gone all in and pulled the cork. You've just tested and you know that needs to wait a bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. Or Terrific. you need to go ahead and drink it. Yes. And I tell people, <laughs> don't. Wine waits for no one. No. <laughs> Open your wine and drink it. Exactly. That's more <laughs> usually the case, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Oh, Tonya, yeah. this is wonderful. Where can we find you online? I am on Facebook, Tonya Pitts. Okay. And I am on Twitter as Tonya Pitts Noir Smollier, and also on Instagram as Noir Smollier. When you put it in, it'll come up as Dame Tonya Pitts they, because they that is what I go. Yes. Yeah. 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 Awesome. That is great. Well, we will link to all of those, all of your socials in the show notes so that people can find you. Of course, people should visit you at One Market Restaurant in San Francisco. Be quite an experience. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And congratulations on your recent win. Being named Sommelier of the Year by Wine Enthusiast Magazine is quite the honor. So congratulations. Well-deserved. Pretty surreal. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> but yeah, so really deserved. You've surreal. had such an illustrious career. Yeah. So yeah. I raise my glass to you, Tonya. Cheers. And I hope we can chat again sometime. Thank you. I appreciate you, Natalie. Oh, thank you. All right. Bye for now. Bye for now. Cheers. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Tonya. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I have so much respect for Tonya's leadership in the wine industry on so many dimensions from diversity to mentorship. She really walks her talk. Two, it's surprising that women still comprise only 20% of winemakers in the industry. Tonya has some great suggestions on how the wine world needs to continue its efforts for inclusion. And three, I can't wait to try Tonya's suggested pairings for Vermentino, and my mouth is already watering thinking of this zesty Italian white wine. In the show notes, you'll find a full transcript of my conversation with Tonya, links to her website and restaurant, and the video versions of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live, and also where you can pre-order my memoir online, no matter where you live. 
That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 227. Email me if you have a tip, sip, or question at natalie at nataliemclean.com. If you missed episode 85, go back and take a listen. I chat about tasting Pinot Noir with the Sideways author, Rex Pickett. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. To want to like wine and want to understand it on an educational level or even be erudite about it, I don't find that to be snobbery. I think that's just like being passionate about anything and wanting right. to know as much as you can. The wonderful thing about wine is it's a bottomless ocean of mystery. <laughs> that's you know, a great way to put it. Sommiers can't even master it. And then every year is different, Natalie, and you can't master it. And I love that fact about it. If you like this episode, please email or tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines, tips, and stories we shared. You won't want to miss next week when I chat with Dr. Clinton Lee, author of Master the Art of Manners, which includes a lot of wine manners in it, and a wine social media influencer with over 2 million followers. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a vibrant Vermentino. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers.